Dark theming reconsidered. It is not you who will speak. Let the disaster speak in you, even if it be your forgetfulness or silence. In 2013, the Amoya Luxury Hotel in Bloemfontein, South Africa, received a rather dubious distinction in the press. CNN, Gismato, Time, and the Colbert Report criticized the Amoya for what many called its appeal to slumming, poorism, and poverty tourism. A fake slum for luxury tourists who don't want to see real poverty, as one of the news sources titled its story. The source of the outrage was the hotel's unique approach to theming. The hotel is designed to resemble a shantytown, the informal settlement common to South Africa and typically inhabited by the poor. The Amoya's version includes corrugated iron sheet dwellings, outdoor fire pits, and interior rooms complemented by long drop effect toilets, paraffin lamps, battery operated radios fashioned in a manner reminiscent of indigenous forms of bricolage art, as well as the conveniences of contemporary hotels like Wi-Fi and heated floors. For any admirer of themed and immersive spaces, the Amoya would likely be described as one of the most interesting and creative of themed hotels, but given the other context that is brought into harsh juxtaposition with the theming, the issue of poverty and social oppression, the space would likely be seen in a much different light. The Amoya Luxury Hotel highlights what is at stake in the contemporary world of postmodern leisure and tourism. In one respect, the hotel represents an inauthentic, offensive, and colonialist project, while in another, it suggests signs of the future of tourism and theming, complex, politically problematic, and entirely avant-garde in orientation. I will return to the case of the Amoya later in this writing. But for this moment, let me use this case as an example, as a way of reviewing and refining the existing work on dark tourism and of suggesting a reevaluation of dark theming. There is a rich and important literature on the topic of dark tourism. Philip Stone has defined dark tourism as, quote, the act of travel to tourist sites associated with death, suffering, and the seemingly macabre, end quote. Typically, dark tourism has been associated with sites that include museums, places as, at which natural disasters or human tragedies have taken place, and other venues that generally focus on aspects of death or the macabre. Previous considerations of dark tourism have focused quite exclusively on the meanings of dark that connote gloomy, sad, cheerless, and sinister. In this research, I wish to, wish to suggest the opposite and the conceptual movement away from these meanings of the word and towards the more distant proto-Germanic etymology of hidden and concealed. In this way, I hope to argue that tourism that is dark is much more than death-focused, thanotourism, as some have called it, and is instead characterized by a range of activities, symbols, and narrative constructions, actions, and interpretations that include reflection on extreme forms of politics and culture, emphasis on avant-garde tendencies and aesthetic experimentalism, and consideration of taboo and forbidden topics. There are three general concerns with the previous constructions of dark tourism that inform this study. First, the literature focuses quite exclusively on what P.E. Tarlow indicates as places of tragedy or death and what Chris Rojak suggests are black spots, such as places to which tourists flock because of a great tragedy, for example, a celebrity death having occurred there. While such sites are significant, they are not the only ones that complete the oeuvre of such tourism. Again, I suggest the need to expand the considerations of both dark, both dark tourism and dark theming to include, include meanings beyond death and the macabre. Second, much of the literature while focused on site-specific examples of darkness, is unable to analyze the spatial, thematic, and narrative underpinnings of such sites. Venues, whether museums or theme park attractions, are seen as staid and non-evolving spaces that consist of monolithic narratives in terms of their topics of death, tragedy, and genocide. As Paul Williams suggests in his important memorial museums, 
spaces of darkness exhibit a sense of spatial orchestration that is part and parcel of the meanings of such, spa of such spaces. I thus aim to focus more attention on the spatial significance of darkness in this expanded analysis of dark tourism and theming. Third, many of the writings on dark tourism focus on interpretations of the form that suggest negativity in terms of the ways in which the spaces are perceived and understood by guests. Similarly, many of these analyses focus on binaries, pedagogy, entertainment, authentic, inauthentic, location-based, non-location-based, and others, with the suggestion being that certain dark venues, particularly theme park rides, campy dungeon attractions, and casinos are inappropriate in terms of their use of such themes in their spaces. In this work, I will emphasize that the deconstruction of these binaries and simplistic assumptions about the theme representations of darkness is quite necessary. With these three concerns in mind, let me then suggest the concept of dark theming as a subset of dark tourism, in which, the, which describes the ways in which disturbing, controversial, political, or other topics and concerns are narrativized and performed in spaces that include museums, theme parks, casinos, restaurants, and other venues. Throughout this work, I will emphasize how dark theming is much more than a novel or entertaining way in which to orient the guest in a themed or immersive space. It is an approach to space that is simultaneously creative and controversial, innovative and off-putting, avant-garde and offensive. I will suggest a series of characteristics of dark theming that simultaneously illustrate its nature and express emerging tendencies of contemporary tourism, leisure, and popular amusement. Throughout this work, I argue for the necessity of dark theming and related forms of dark tourism as a meaningful way of expressing existential, nihilistic, and postmodern interpretations, experiences, and ideas in the contemporary world. Dark theming's doppelganger. During my years as an employee trainer at Six Flags Astroworld, I became intimately familiar with what might be called the doppelganger image of the theme park. What often consumed my work as a trainer, especially my time conducting undercover plain clothes audits of park locations, involved my seeking out and erasing any traces of Astroworld's dark side. If Astroworld represented safe, clean, wholesome family entertainment, it was my job to assess and act on situations in which the opposite, opposite the doppelganger, was present. An employee not properly dressed, excessive garbage outside of a restaurant, and many other examples expressed the theme park's doppelganger. Even when a theme park is functioning in a near-perfect manner, signs of the theme park double are omnipresent. In such cases, the narratives of particular spaces or rides point to dark or absent meanings. One example of such a case is the fact that the foundational narratives of many rides and attractions deliberately eschew political, dark, disturbing, or existential meanings. Stephen Fagelman, in his text Vinyl Leaves, points to such exclusion of meaning in the Walt Disney World ride, The Hall of Presidents. The Vietnam War, what would be considered a dark period of American history, is only referenced reference in a very oblique manner on the ride. Indeed, for many theme parks and theme spaces, particularly those that are part of larger brand or media conglomerates, the focus on avoiding negative associations with rides, attractions, or other entities is paramount. Consider the recent controversies that have been attributed to SeaWorld theme parks in the wake of the documentary film Blackfish. The film suggests that SeaWorld's use of killer whales in captivity is problematic for its impact on the whales and for deaths and injuries of human traders that have occurred. In this case, we see that the doppelganger is an absence that, if made present, could negatively impact the theme park and its ability to sell its products. In 2005, the controversial artist Paul McCarthy opened a new installation in a London warehouse called Caribbean Pirates. The piece is notable for its riffing off of the famous Disney ride and now transmedia form Pirates of the Caribbean. The work occupied a series of rooms in the warehouse, each fe featuring video screens that depicted horrific and macabre pirates engaged in various acts of violence and debauchery. According to the artists, quote, 
we started working on that piece and made all these vignettes from the ride at Disney. It's a way of doing things. Flip it around on itself so it's a new world. End quote. Not unlike McCarthy's re-presentation of Disney, Disney's iconic ride, much of the fictional literature on theme parks, including Mitch Albom's uh, Sentimental, The Fine People We Meet in Heaven, Robert Stewart, Stewart Nathan's Amusement Park, Lincoln Child's New Utopia, Julian Barnes' satirical England, England, and many films including Roller Coaster, Westworld, and Future World, all tend to focus their concerns on the dark and edible aspects of theme parks, mechanical park disasters, terrorism and violence, and bringing to the surface disturbing, tawdry, unwholesome, or inappropriate elements that are typically excluded from real, real world places of amusement. The most recent of such examples, the cult film Escape from Tomorrow, follows a similar path and brings in absent theme park signifiers like creeping corporatism and brandism and overcharge and anti-familial masculinity. These examples all point to the, to the desire to give voice to the absent and dark double that is implied and sometimes made manifest in all theme parks. Theming's doppelganger is, however, more than a mere Oedipal reflection of popular amusements. It represents the growing institutionalization of dark theming within the industry. I argue that the emergence of dark theming coincides with a new period of leisure and popular amusements in which the figure of the doppelganger, the double, is especially privileged. As other areas of this work will explore, the desire to give voice to the dark and absent sides of popular amusements is a trend that will likely result in more examples of darkness that is not implied or brought to the surface after the fact, but is actually a foundation of the space from its inception. Dark theming, a reflection of post-modernity. In 2009, the company Dutch by Design created a controversial duvet cover and sheet set that received notable attention in the popular press. The company's design included a photographic representation of a cardboard box on the duvet cover and a similar photographic reproduction of what appears to be the concrete of a typical street. The design was meant to mimic the bedding arrangements of a homeless person, a fact that upset many critics in the press. The representations they suggested were created without taste and without concerns for the politics of homelessness. What made the controversy even more curious was the fact that Dutch by Design donated 30% of its profits from the bedding items to the UK charity Centerpoint. The company's representatives argued that, quote, the, the home duvet lets you sleep under a cardboard box so a homeless person doesn't have to, end quote. Even with this caveat, many critics were of the opinion that such a representation of reality was unwarranted. I suggest a counter reading of Dutch by Design's bedding and use it to offer my next premise about dark theming, namely that it reflects the cultural, aesthetic, and economic orientations of postmodernity. In Dark Tourism, John Lennon and Malcolm Foley argue that dark tourism represents an intimation of postmodernity, particularly as it highlights the convergence of a series of facets of postmodernity, the interplay of media and communication technologies and resultant global local blurring and time space compressing, the intertwining of educational and commercial consumer facets of the world, and most significantly, the expression of, quote, an anxiety and doubt about the project of modernity, end quote. Dark themed venues like the Dede Air Museum in Berlin highlight these many facets of postmodernity and dark tourism that are identified by Lenin and Foley. The museum is one of many new European venues that focuses on the darkness of the past. In the case of the Dede Air Museum, the difficult era of East Germany and the Stasi is considered in highly technological, immersive, and interactive exhibits. At one point during the guest's visit to the space, he or she has the opportunity to take part in a faux Stasi interrogation. Critics have charged that the museum is guilty of nostalgia, 
a shallow representation of Berlin's communist past with little attention to education or critical analysis. What is curious about such criticisms is that they appear to take issue with the manner in which context is developed in the space. The displays are too technological or interactive. There is less direct commentary about the displays given to the guests. There is too much of a consumer drive in the museum as it has a restaurant and a gift shop are among the many criticisms that have been suggested. To return, in Len to, return to Lenin and Foley's work, I would argue that the museum reflects two of the facets that they offer in terms of dark tourism's relationship with postmodernity, namely the concern with technology and media and the merging of educational and consumer tendencies, and that the responses to the Dede Air Museum's approach to content reflect, reflect anxiety with the new directions that are emerging in themed spaces. As well, the museum's blurred approach to presenting information to the visitor suggests opportunities to reformulate tired notions about the truth and its sober representation in museum spaces. In line with the Museum of Jurassic Technology, which I will consider later, the Dede Air Museum's approach to troubling and disturbing periods of history is accomplished by its postmodern use of technology, design, immersion, and narrative. Dark themings interfacing with other facets of postmodernity, particularly those found in the worlds of new media, aesthetics, information design, and consumer culture, suggests that more museums will follow the Dede Air Museum's trends in the future. Earlier, I wrote of the many controversies that surround the Amoya Luxury Hotel in Bloemfontein, South Africa. As I discussed, the main concerns about the Amoya centered on the idea that the representation of a South African shantytown was in bad taste, was in bad taste, offensive, and reflective of new forms of consumer society that are politically and morally unsavory. Indeed, these and many other issues should be considered in the context of this and other theme spaces that focus on dark issues. As Melty Steinbrink writes of slum tourism, one of the con consequences of new interest in slums is a certain ethnization of slumming that occurs when guests to such spaces of tourism develop ethnocentric stereotypes about those people who live in slums or socioeconomically depressed places. Certainly, ethnocentrism is one possible result of the guest immersion in a space like the Amoya. However, it may not be the only outcome. As a cultural anthropologist who studies themed and immersive spaces, and a former theme park trainer, I would claim that there exists no one monolithic guest in the world, and thus it is a misassumption to presume that every guest would leave a slum-themed space as a bigot or even a racist. In fact, in the world of postmodern tourism, there is a new tendency in which guests seek out new, experimental, even dangerous forms of tourism. Certain guests who might visit or stay at the Amoya might indeed use their experience in the space as a form of experimental tourism. Likewise, other guests could leave the space entirely transformed and politically motivated to deal with pressing issues like those of post-apartheid South Africa, including poverty and racism. At the moment in which the guest is forced to confront his or her complicity in both the systems of oppression that includes apartheid South Africa and its correlates, violence, racism, and poverty, and in the consumerist representation in which he or she is involved in while staying at the hotel, this is the point at which one may argue that the Amoya offers an opportunity to consider dark issues in an entirely new and potentially efficacious manner. A reversal of the Pleasure Pain Foundation. The last example of the Amoya Luxury Hotel illustrates another facet of dark theming in postmodern times, namely, there is a reversal of the pleasure pain foundation of tourist and consumer spaces. Most themed and consumer spaces have at their heart the idea that everything within the space, the design, experiences, services, and products, is oriented to the guest's enjoyment and happiness. Service industry workers of such spaces often struggle to deal with this foundation since they are commonly asked to suspend their own happiness for the sake of the guest. But as the Amoya suggests, there may be something darker around the corner when it comes to the fulfillment of the guest's needs. In fact, many spaces and design experiments are slowly altering this assumption that seems so embedded in consumer space. 
One of the most prescient spaces that has suggested this new orientation of space in terms of the denial of the guest's pleasure is the contemporary memorial, museum, or monument. During a series of research visits to Berlin in 2015, I had the opportunity to see firsthand the ways in which Germans are addressing Vergangenheitsbewältigung, roughly struggling with or dealing with the past. Berlin has an especially dark history in terms of its national socialist and Holocaust past, and thus it is fitting that its many museums and monuments reflect this sense of struggle. Peter Eisenman's Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe was the first of my Berlin research trips that focused on the design responses to dark history. The memorial consists of over 2,700 concrete slabs of different heights that are arranged in rows utilizing changes in elevation the result of which creates a certain unease in the individual who visits the space. The second of these spaces, Daniel Liebeskin's Jewish Museum Berlin, offers similar approaches to design as that of Eisenmann's. The visitor notes the many examples of absence within the space, including here these very interesting voids that Liebeskin created to express, quote, that which never can be exhibited when it comes to Jewish Berlin history, humanity reduced to ashes, end quote. And the striking Holocaust Tower, which features a very small slit at the top through which sunlight enters, and is asked, as in the case of Eisenman's memorial, the guest is asked to comprehend the incomprehensible in terms of the Holocaust and Berlin's dark past. Most powerful in the Jewish Museum Berlin is the Garden of Exile, which features 49 concrete pillars arranged on a 12 degree gradient that is designed, in Liebeskind's words, to completely disorient the visitor. It represents a shipwreck of history. Both of these examples of Berlin's memorialization and musealization of the past illustrate the requirement of the guest within each space to undergo discomfort as he or she moves through it. This is nothing new for museums and memorials that focus on the Holocaust and genocide. But what is unique is the role that architecture and design plays in this forcing of the guest to experience discomfort and existential anxiety. But what can be said of the creation of such discomfort and pain in the guest and spaces beyond those of museums and memorials. There is one striking example of the reversal of the Pleasure Pain Foundation in the world of theme parks, and this is Disney's America in the 1990s. The park would have included historical reconstructions of a Civil War era village, President's Square representing the genesis, genesis of American democracy, a Native American themed area a Civil War era theme land complete with a Coney Island-like monitor and Merrimack battle reconstruction, the landmark of Ellis Island and its representative ethnics, a factory town that denoted the American Industrial Revolution, and a victory field that referenced the American proclivity for warfare. Most notable in Disney's efforts to recreate the past in this failed theme park was the explicit focus on the Civil War and slavery. Early in the debates over Disney's America, satirical cartoons began to appear that ultimately mocked the idea of Disney dealing with a, quote, serious topic. Likely, it wasn't much of a help to Disney's cause when Disney officials offered, quote, we will show you the Civil War with all its racial conflict. We want to make you feel what it was like to be a slave or what it was like to escape through the Underground Railroad. In response to such statements, historian William Styron questioned that Disney's approach could do anything but mock a theme as momentous as slavery. No combination of branding iron slave ships or slave cabins, shackles, chain black people, or treks through the Underground Railroad could begin to define such a stupendous experience. The criticism of Disney's America and its proposed focus on dark history seem to have in common the notion of the sobriety of history, or the idea that only certain spaces such as museums should have the right to consider disturbing periods of the past. Had the park been built, we may have witnessed a radical shift in the theme park industry such that a new purpose and focus of the guest would have been realized. 
if the expectation of the guest was to have a splendid time, this would have been likely met with the opposite force, an existential one that would have required the guest to ironically have a bad or at least dark and uncomfortable time at the park. Dark theming and existential and nihilistic tendencies. The idea of a space privileging the pain and discomfort of the guest and not the reversed reminds of another facet of dark theming, the arena of existentialism and nihilism. Interestingly, we may look to the past to see widespread evidence of existential and nihilistic trends in amusements. In the early part of the 20th century, the amusement parks of Coney Island, including Sealand Park, Steeplechase Park, Luna Park, and Dreamland, offered forms of entertainment, rides, and attractions that covered topics ranging from the Boer War, the Galveston Flood, the fall of Pompeii, the gates of hell, and offered oddities like, quote, midget worlds in Lilliputia, firefighting demonstrations, the blowhole theater, premature baby incubators, even the electrocution of an elephant named Topsy. Many of these attractions also opened in World's Fair at Midways and were ones that generated much of the popularity of late 19th and early 20th century outdoor amusement spaces. The nature of these attractions whose concerns range from disaster, warfare, death, religion, and unnatural humans aligns with inherently existential and nihilistic tendencies. Existentialism suggests a concern with looking inward, at asking the questions about reality and existence that are not typically addressed in contexts of everyday life, while nihilism considers the absurdity of life, the moments of doubt and uncertainty, and life's capricious and unexplained nature. Within the world of popular culture, there are numerous examples of such existential and nihilistic expressions. The worlds of film and popular television include greater emphasis on disturbing topics, anti-heroes, and narratives that move beyond the typical good overcoming evil and overtly happy and cheerful storylines. Audiences are more and more desirous of narratives of popular culture that are complex, unfinished, depressing, and ultimately existential in that they require the audience member to deeply contemplate much more than the media form or story at hand. These tendencies have influenced the world of themed and immersive spaces, particularly as we are now witnessing spaces that are reminiscent of dark and disturbing examples that were a part of the Coney Island amusement park tradition. One of the most curious and controversial of contemporary themed spaces is the Heart Attack Grill in Las Vegas, Nevada. Not unlike the many other spaces considered in this work, this themed restaurant has received notable negative attention in the national press. In no small part, this is due to the unique approach to theming at the restaurant. In 2015, while conducting research at the venue, I was, I was surprised to read these signs on the front of the restaurant. I am probably the only restaurateur in the entire world who is unapologetically telling you that my food is bad for you, that it will kill you, and that you should, have, you should stay away from it. We're past the point of no return at the heart attack grill. We have blood on our hands at this point. These people have the right to weigh what they want to weigh, to eat what they want to eat, and have the right to serve them that food. And I have the right to serve them that food. I make good money selling unhealthy food, but at least I'm honest. These and many other quotes by John Basso, the restaurant's founder, adorn the front of the space during my visit. The quotes suggest the complexity of the construction of dark theming, especially in the contradictory messages they contain. On the one hand, Basso takes responsibility for serving unhealthy food, and on the other, he argues for the right of any person to eat what he or she wants to eat. The restaurant also features a hospital theme, scantily clad waitresses dressed as nurses, a scale for guests to weigh themselves with the offer of over 350 pounds eats free, a Last Supper painting featuring all of the various recognizable fast food cartoon characters and many items that reflect the theming single bypass burger, flatliner fries, and other variations. As a theme space, the restaurant is like many other spaces in that it focuses on a consistent theme that is noticeable and evocative. But what is so obviously different about the Heart Attack Grill is the fact that it has meditated on its theme at such a conceptual and political level. 
Lost in the media's moralism about the restaurant is the venue's uniqueness in terms of how it has earnestly and reflexively focused on its complicity in nutritional issues. The Heart Attack Grill's founder, John Basso, has called his guests the, quote, avant-garde of nutritional risk takers. And while this use of the avant-garde may seem tongue-in-cheek, the nature of such an existentially focused restaurant suggests some interesting affinities with the world of conceptual aesthetics. A conceptual side of dark theming. Conceptual spaces are ones that challenge the traditional understandings, uses, and constructions of theming and immersion. Such venues are type breakers as they suggest new ways of understanding traditional space and indeed they point us in new directions because as conceptual spaces they get us to think about theming and immersion and their reference in the deepest senses possible. The Museum of Jurassic Technology in Culver City, California is one example of such a conceptual space. One could call it a museum, but this misses the point of the space, which is to challenge our perceptions of what a museum is. An exhibit like the one in which a bat is suspended mid-flight in a piece of solid concrete and which, it is said, was to have gotten stuck in the middle of the object while using its unique technique of traveling through solid objects, asks the guests to reflect on the idea of a museum itself, including the issue of what is true and untrue in a museum. A second space that is worth mentioning is Dennis Seaver's house in London. Like the Museum of Jurassic Technology, Dennis Seaver's house challenges the visitor's perception of a museum or interpretive center. Many of the exhibits are offered in fanciful ways that seem to wink at the guest as if playing a joke on him or her. As well, an evocative use of sensory design ranging from oral, olfactory, and other senses suggests a much different approach to the state museum that lacks full sensory and evocative potentials. Conceptual spaces are type breakers, particularly because they force the guest to reconsider everything that she or he or she has known before about the type of space, issue, or experience at hand. Neither the Museum of Jurassic Technology nor Dennis Seaver's house are per se spaces of explicit dark theming, but their nature as conceptual spaces, as places that challenge guests in so many unique ways, suggests an allegiance to other spaces described in this research and a reminder of the need to revise old and limited definitions of dark tourism. Dark theming indicates a growing conceptual trend in popular amusements, a trend that asks critical questions of designers, operators, and guests of theme spaces as well their cultural critics. Spaces that rely on a conceptual focus suggest that the guests who visit them use them to contemplate existential, social, political, and other issues. Because of this focus, we might say that such spaces exhibit the idea of what Umberto Eco has called the open work, a text that allows the reader to make conclusions and interpretations because of the room or opportunity that the author has given him or her. The desire to create more open and con contemplative spaces will, no doubt, necessitate new innovations in the worlds of themed and immersive space design. But one curious issue about contemporary spaces, especially those that explicitly deal with dark or controversial topics, is whether some designers will create innovative conceptual spaces that nonetheless lack important foci of guest input, reflexivity, and the like. An ex an ex as an example, we note the growth of toilet and Nazi-themed restaurants and cafes around the world. Both types of team theme spaces are dark spaces in that they deal with controversial or difficult topics. We may consider such spaces ones that exhibit what George Bataille noted as the low, or that which is underground, subversive, even Rabelaisian. While toilet and Nazi-themed restaurants express Bataille's low, they, quite problematically, fail at political levels. In the case of toilet theme venues, the low begins and ends with a toilet bowl. Never is the guest asked to contemplate issues that could be associated with toilets, excrement, filth, waste, sacrifice, and so forth. Instead, the guest is left to be simply amused with the ubiquitous toilets within the space. In the case of the Nazi themed restaurant, unfortunately, the guest is not asked to reflect on the ills of national socialism, the Holocaust, or associated issues. 
Instead, it would appear that as in most cases of such dark-themed venues, the guest is asked to simply eat and take in the decor, a pure pandering to the lowest common denominator of shocking design and materiality. Conceptual spaces of the sort that I have described in this work should do more than merely shock us. As well, they may do more than simply get us to think about the world in more avant-garde senses. They may suggest an awakening within the world of theme space design in which designers will tackle more complex projects that push the limits of the past. In other work, I have suggested that conceptual space will likely involve nine areas of innovation of the future, ranging from the increased use of irony, irony to mysticism to reflexivity and flux. One area of new emphasis involves the use of dark theming for reflexive purposes. Reflexivity and pedagogy in themed and immersive spaces. While conducting research at the 2015 World Exposition in Milan, Italy, I came across the interesting space of the Swiss Pavilion. Like much of the Expo, the Swiss Pavilion emphasizes the Expo's overall theme of food through the lens of scarcity and environmentalism. What is more is that the designers of the pavilion emphasize that scarcity must be connected to issues of personal responsibility and the need for praxis or action in social settings. As they state, the journey through the towers is guided by this leitmotif, thus prompting visitors to reflect on the basis of their own personal experience on the global availability of food and sustainable development throughout the food value chain. Visitors will be free to take away or consume any amount of the products. How much will be left for later visitors and for how long will be determined by the consumer behavior and level of awareness of each visitor. The pavilion is constructed with four towers, each of which has a finite amount of four key food items, coffee, apple, water, and salt, each chosen for their relevance as Swiss foodway symbols as well as their connection to key issues of global sustainability and scarcity. Within the space, the guest is challenged in two senses each of which emphasizes two important facets of dark theming. These include reflexivity or the tendency of such theming to force the guest to reflect on his or her own condition, often resulting in realizations of complicity and systems of oppression, and pedagogy, or the use of theming to instruct didactically in such a way that the guest may be changed after visiting the space. As Paul Williams notes, Many memorial museums are accustomed to using both reflexivity and pedagogy as means of creating empathy between the guests and victims of the past, present, or future during the course of their visit. Yet, there is a difference in terms of the constructions of darkness that we note in a space like the Swiss Pavilion at the 2015 World Exposition in Milan and the memorial, mu memorial museums described by Williams. In the case of some museums of genocide, the emphasis on victimization and troubling acts of the past may not always inspire the guest to take action in the present. In the case of other spaces, including the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles and the Swiss Pavilion at the Exposition, the guest is asked to both reflect on and to take a position. In the Museum of Tolerance case, the visitor is asked to focus on his or her own prejudice, hopefully for the purpose of change. In the case of the Swiss Pavilion, the individual is forced to reflect on the consumption problem, as in a brain teaser or scenario, at hand, the scarcity of the four food items, and then is asked to analogize the scarcity with the overall shortage of food in the world, as well as related environmental and social issues. As pedagogical venues in which guests are asked to consider disturbing topics in reflexive senses, such spaces also suggest a last facet of dark theming, that of the political and of social justice. Within the world of popular culture and consumerism, more and more, we see examples of politics, ethics, and social justice being a primary concern of the company or brand at hand, the act of consumption on the part of the consumer, and the overall meaning that is attributed to the entirety of the brand or product as it is part of the world. Patagonia's Footprint Chronicles, which focus on the company's responsibility to the environment and its workers, is one example of a new corporate agenda that considers social justice as part and parcel of its operation and brand identity. A quasi-themed space, Whole Foods, also expresses similar commitments to the environment, social justice, and its workers. In 2014, Whole Foods in Reno, Nevada themed a small area of its store to resemble a Ghanaian indigenous dwelling and with it included information about investing in a future without poverty. 
Some critics have expressed somewhat cynically that such examples of consumer and brand activism are ineffective at best or a ploy to increase sales at worst. Theme parks, including Disney's Animal Kingdom, have also invited guests to ponder environmental, political, and social justice issues, all the while partaking in experiences that are deemed to be entertaining. The challenge in these and many other cases is to avoid the harsh dichotomies and simplifications that are often suggested by critics and instead partake in the interesting and innovative spaces, both material and discursive, that invite the most critical of debates. Not only will we see more innovative and exciting theming and immersion of the sort exhibited at the 2015 World Expo in Milan, we will likely come to realize that much more is at stake in the world of popular amusements than we had realized. With new theming and immersive designs, we may only hope that the moral, political, social, and existential narratives that they entail as well as their criticism, will be as innovative. Thank you very much.